Memories of working at John Dickinson and Company Limited Apsley Mills. My name is Terry Quinlan, age 75. I was born and lived in the centre of Hemel Hempstead, so therefore I am a Hempsteadian. Educated at Berry Mill Ends Primary and Junior Schools in Berry Road. Moving on at the age of 11 to Corner Hall Secondary Modern School for Boys in Crabtree Lane. The school was known locally as Prison on the Hill because being situated at the top of a hill, that is how it appeared, it really was just like a barracks in, in appearance. I left school in 1952, age 15, and started work in August of that year at my one and only place of employment, John Dickinson, Apsley Mills, sometimes referred to as JDs or Dickos. I travelled to work in the early days with my father, who also worked there. This was by a coach company, either Bream Coaches of Hemel Hempstead or B&B Coaches of Potton End, and in later years by London Country Buses. On occasions I also travelled as a passenger on a work colleague's motorcycle. I bought a daily newspaper from Walker's News Agents and Tobacconist in Marlowe's or from Reg Hunt, who stood outside JD's main entrance, and who owned a newspaper and tobacconist in Apsley. On arriving at work, we had to clock in using a machine known as a Bundy clock, and again at lunchtime, only clocking out when working overtime. My father wanted me to have a trade, and as John Dickinson was the major employee in the area at the time, it seemed appropriate for the, this to be in the printing industry. On my first morning, I was met at the main entrance along with another lad and taken by the foreman of the rotary machine printing room of book department to where I would be working. We were then introduced and left with the supervisor who proceeded to give us some ground rules to follow. He was very particular about his appearance, mostly regarding his shoes he had one pair for travelling and another for working. The travelling pair were very highly polished. He kept his polishing equipment at work. He then proceeded to give us a lesson in shoe polishing, comparing his with ours. He was satisfied with mine, but not the other lads, which were scruffy and unpolished. He was none too pleased about this and told the lad in no uncertain terms that he would not accept anything less than polished shoes. Because of this he was told to go home, which was Watford, and return the next day with his shoes polished. Needless to say this lad did not stay with the company very long. Working with the supervisor I then knew what to expect regarding discipline. Later on my work colleagues told me that he had served in the army as a military policeman and carried on as if he was still in the forces. Some months later, I was signed on as a suitable candidate for a printing apprenticeship for a period of seven years. The print room contained six machines, one being 50 feet in length and operated by the supervisor. As my experience grew as an apprentice, much of my time was spent running this machine with the help of a general labourer whilst the supervisor organised the rest of the workload for the room. Reels of paper consisting of many yards and of varying widths had to be reeled down the room to one end of the machine, squashing many cockroaches as they went. The reels were then positioned by means of a chain hoist onto the machine of varying heights. This machine was capable of printing one to four reels of paper simultaneously, up to four feet in width. A rotary letterpress is a printing press in which the images to be printed are cast on a curved metal plate which were clipped to a rotating cylinder and would print against a continuous reel of paper. It could print up to four colours in turn consecutively number, perforate, fold, collate, also sprocket hole punching for continuous stationery. It was powered by a large electric motor 
some four feet in height, which had to be crossed on occasions by means of a step platform. It was mainly used in the production of the Challenge Book range of stationery, which consisted of duplicate, triplicate, receipts, etc. Also, other orders came from customers with special requirements. The printed work left the machine onto a tilted jogging table to neatly square up the paper, then removed by hand and stacked onto a pallet ready for to be taken to the next operation. It was noisy, dirty, with ink, oil and dust and dangerous work involving moving heavy reels of paper. The last hour of the working week would be taken up with cleaning ink ducts and rollers and general machine cleaning. If sprocket punching had been used, an airline hose was used to clear the punch debris. The large reels of paper used to have a round wooden bun hammered into. Sorry, let's have a look. See, I'm losing my place here. The large reels of paper used to have a round wooden bun hammered into the center, so that if the reels were ever dropped during transit, it would prevent the center from collapsing. This is one of the wooden bungs. Sometimes this size, and sometimes some, around about half this size, but the greater majority were the smaller ones. These wooden bungs were all collected and put into a hessian sack. When full, these sacks were then distributed to elderly people to be used as firewood. When the staff had gone to lunch and the room was empty, an employee from another department used to pass through our room as a shortcut on his way home for lunch, but he had a habit of removing some of these bungs from the sack, placing them in his bag to use on his own fire. We took exception to this, so on one occasion to try and prevent it from happening again, we smothered the top bungs in the sack with purple ink. When we returned, we found a lot of ink had been all wiped down the outside of the sack. This had the desired effect, and it did not occur again. As I mentioned earlier, our supervisor was a stickler for discipline and rubbed many people up the wrong way. Because of this, they had a way of getting back at him. Besides the foreman, he was the only other person allowed to answer the telephone, which was situated at the far end of the room. Sometimes the printed work had to be numbered and because the numbering boxes were situated under the machine these had to be adjusted. This meant that the supervisor or myself had to lie on a board under the machine to do the adjustment, just like this. <coughs> a prank used on the supervisor was that one of the workers would place a cloth on the vibrating jogging table with a glass milk bottle on the top and with a still ruler touching the bottle would imitate the phone ringing and believe me this really did sound like the real thing. Up he would jump you know oh, catch his head nearly every time he caught his head or twisted his ankle getting out something there was always some form of injury which gave the person who was doing the trick with the still ruler a great deal of satisfaction that his little prank had worked, you know, and he'd got his own back on this supervisor. That was that was a little story regarding that. In 1961, two years after my apprenticeship ended, I married. As my experience grew, I moved around the print room on various other presses. When the workload was heavy, on occasions I worked with one other person on the in the evening. The print room overlooked the canal and one machine ran alongside the windows. Sometimes work was a bit repetitious and on occasions we had time to ourselves while the machine was running. This machine was fitted with an angle poised lamp with an 8 inch diameter shade. We used to get a piece of card and cut out words and place it in front of the lamp so that the light shone through. When it was dusk and a barge was passing with the bargee and his family, we would swing the light towards the window and place the card over the shade and switch it on and off. It read fish and chips. There were at some 
times some downright dangerous pranks attempted. One of these provided, sorry, one of these involved the milk used for our mid-morning break. Some irresponsible person emptied a bottle and replaced the milk with white latex glue and replaced the top. This was then given to one lad in particular who liked to drink direct from the bottle. Some of us thought about the consequences of this action being so dangerous and had to put a stop to him drinking before things got out of hand. Somebody said to me, you've missed a trick. And I, uh, I said, what's that? And he said, well, you used to work with tools, didn't you? So, and these look playing tricks on these lads. I said, yeah. He says, well, don't you, you know the one about the bucket of steam? See? Bucket of steam. So we used to send these lads, and of course, I don't know if you can appreciate what the length of Dickinson's was. It was quite some length. And, you know, when the things were running and they, they'd done all the sweeping up in the room, we'd get one of these lads, you'd say, pop down to, right down the other end, down to the... Um, um, to the boiler room, you know, can you, there's, there's a bucket here, can you go down and get a bucket of steam please, you know, and off he'd run, and the foreman would come over and say, where's John? So he'd say, I don't know, I don't know where he's gone, you know, because he'd come back, he said, where you been? He said, I've been sent down for a bucket of steam, he said, and of course then there was the, the left and the right handed screwdriver, you know, to send him down for all, all this sort of things, you know, so one of they, these, People said to me last night, well, well, you should have put that in. And I said, well, everybody knows those little stories. But there was lots of little things like that, you know. And then, yeah, so, yeah, we used to have a laugh as well, you know. I think all, all, all trades people used to have a laugh in some ways, you know. I was also told last night by somebody else that they'd, they'd put the, um, I am not can't think of the word because I don't drive, but the stands that you put your car up on if you want to, you're doing a little bit of work underneath. You want to put it onto onto the stands, and they used to put the, the raise the car up on these stands so the wheels were just just off of the ground. And the lad would come running out, I'm going to take me girl to the pictures tonight. Come running out, jump in his car to drive off. And there's the car on the stands, you know, and the wheels spinning round, you know, all these little tricks. And that reminded me of other things, you know, that that occurred, you know. People coming out with that light. That was only yesterday evening. Yeah, yeah. So many pranks were paid. Where they still are in industry, I suppose they are. Yes. Yeah. The quickest hour of the day was the lunch break, spent in the works canteen, known as the Guild House, which was opposite the main factory building. This was my main cooked meal of the day. I always spent this hour sitting with my mates, some reading the daily newspaper, playing chess, myself and another attempting the Daily Mirror crossword, and if unfinished, was taken home for the clever one at home, that's the wife, to hopefully finish it. In the late 60s, my health began to deteriorate. I went on to Holloway to work, still on the ground floor and known as the flatbed printing. I then moved to a more modern building on a higher level, known as Book and Continuous Stationery Composing Department, in which I operated two Heidelberg platen machines, printing orders of various quantities. These machines printed one colour at a time and if necessary print it again, adding e other colours. These jobs consisted of printing letterheads and labels. Working in the composing room I found to be most interesting and picked up some of the basic knowledge of composing. I got particularly friendly with the person working next to me. A few years my senior, he was a keen gardener and had an allotment behind the now demolished Fountain Public House in Apsley, growing vegetables and flowers. He collected the wild flower seeds and would then rise at first light in the morning at, in spring and summer months, hop on his bike, riding around the countryside scattering the seeds in the hedgerows as he went. He would always arrive at work bringing his breakfast food with him which he ate while reading his daily newspaper. His mid-morning break would mainly consist of bread and butter 
and a whole raw onion. He was also a bit of a prankster in a nice way. Some mornings, being the first to arrive, he would rub garlic on a colleague's work tools, but he was still glied by everyone and he passed away too early in life. My work at this composing room was only for a short time because in the early 70s the whole of book department printing moved on to an older part of the factory known as envelope printing. This then became known as imperial printing. The two machines I was operating went with me which I then only operated for a short period. I was then moved on to a vertical mealing machine, still a single colour but the work was larger and of a higher quality. Unfortunately my health didn't improve and an opportunity arose in the department's composing room operating a smaller press, printing mainly proof work for the company. I enjoyed the challenge of doing an exacting job and working with mainly coloured inks, mixing and matching them. On occasions I had to take these proofs to the person who was dealing with the customer for his views, also to a department's printing foreman as to whether the printer would be mixing the inks or it would be sent to an ink manufacturer to mix. This would sometimes depend on the size of the order. There was some pride in seeing the finished product displayed on station and shelves. I also did work on this press for senior management such as invitation cards for weddings, order of services and dance cards etc. Well, Some of this work wasn't all produced uh, on the proof in press for John Dickinson, it was other customers that sent in for work and this was an example of some Christmas envelopes that I was asked to proof up for a company. And as you can see by the register marks down here, I don't know whether the camera's picking this up, but they're not registering quite right, one colour on top of another. And as you can see here, the black spot isn't in the centre. And because of my age, my hand is shaking around a bit, so I apologise for that. So, that is, the black had to be moved over to get it right in the centre. And so, I believe on the other side I've got the finished article. So there you are, and that was a nice little envelope with a cutout here, so whatever goes in the envelope could be seen through. Then we come round to what we get these days coming through the letterbox and so forth, a load of rubbish. Well, these started to come through the letterbox as well. Every few days people were getting this type of thing coming through your letterbox, you know, trying to sell you various records and so forth. Star was those days, but obviously he was very keen on the collie dogs. And this one, well, dear dear, we used to, these were Reader's Digest, all producer writers. Reader, we used to send millions and millions of these. Just you think, every household in the country would receive one of these through their letter boxes, and very good. Many many used to light the fire with. I think these, whether you wanted to take these offers up, so. You, you would then post off that one if you was thinking, well, I may take the offer up. Reader's Digest, the cookery year, free approval, and free gift voucher, maybe. No, they even even if you didn't want to take part in this, they still aren't wanted to get an answer from you. Reader's Digest based at the Old Bailey. So all these were done in various colours and uh, sometimes left to me, sometimes the customer wanted a particular colour to catch people's eyes. This gave me personally a great deal of satisfaction to start printing these. So that's how it started off in that form. So they said, well, can you produce some different colours and we'll, we'll see what, what we like. So these were for Ryman Brothers. So that's how it started off. You can see on this one, for instance, 
There is no black edging at all round. And then it was suggested that we try and put a black edging round. And you can see the difference then with the different colour. Stands out far, far greater. So that one got accepted. As did this one, and this was, well, as I said to you earlier, I do like the purple. So I suggested this as well. So that one also got accepted by Ryman Brothers. Having spent some time off work with ill health, it was agreed that I should take early retirement for medical reasons early in 1980, having served the company for nearly 28 years. Within a few months, many of my former colleagues were made redundant. Unfortunately, I passed. I missed out on all of the redundancy pay. Thank you very much.